Uh, this is my family. Uh, my wife of almost 18 years, Yen Yen. I have two biological girls, Anna and Enen. They're 13 and 11. And Jenny is with us now. She's 17. Jenny hails, her family originally hails from Oaxaca, Mexico. So that's uh, my family. I pastor Ethnos, New Brunswick. Uh, we meet at a comedy club in downtown New Brunswick. That's the next picture. And so uh, we've been at it for about two and a half years now. And so that's kind of what we do. If you're familiar with New Brunswick, the Rutgers University area, uh, you'll know the comedy club is a place to be. And then, uh, yeah, Sam, you all are part of the Ethnos Network. And that's the next picture. Uh, we are a still budding new network of around, uh, uh, I think, 15, 17 churches in 15 global cities, six countries. Uh, we focus in on urban areas uh, next to major global universities. And so uh, we're on all sorts of places. And this is uh, actually in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, last, uh, just a few months ago, we had our global gathering. And uh, this is kind of us hanging out uh, on the first day there. You can see Ying over there. I don't know where Sam is in this picture. He's somewhere here, somewhere here. But uh, that, that's the crew. Um, I'm, I'm excited to be here and to just spend some time with you because I know very, very close to your heart is this issue of being a healthy church and being a healthy and good church for the city of Dallas and the world beyond. And as a network director, as, as the network director, what I enjoy doing is spending time with our different churches, encouraging them and challenging them to continue forward with all the good that God is already doing in our various network churches. And so I want to get today started just with a brief question that I'd love for you to turn to your neighbors and just process really quickly as you think about uh, who you are here as Loft and what God has invited you to do here at Loft. And so if you could take about a minute or so and turn to your neighbor and answer this question together. What would Dallas be like? What would Dallas Metro be like? If you were living the best life God had, to, God had to offer you, what would Dallas be like if you were living the best life God had to offer you? You about a minute, turn to your neighbor. Let's process that question together. Uh, 20 more seconds, 20 more seconds. So I'll be curious, uh, as you talked it over with your neighbor, let, let's just kind of open it up this morning for some, for some uh, response here, for some feedback. What would you talk about with your neighbor? What would Dallas be like if you were living the best life God had for you? Everybody, just shout it out. What would Dallas be like? Zero waste, okay, all right, all right. More community, okay, yeah. What else? Good driving. All right, okay, I can tell a lot of you agree with that. Okay, all right, right out, right out. What else, what else? Okay. Potluck every day, okay, okay, right out. I like that, I like that. Anybody else? Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, that's exciting. Yeah, community, community, friendships, dinner. I, I'm hearing a theme here. Yeah, what else? 
Anybody else want to add to this conversation? A lot less need? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what, what, what's fascinating as I uh, have been in Dallas now just for a couple days, and um, I, I don't get to Dallas a whole lot, and so, um, but every time I'm here, like, there are constantly things being built here in Dallas, and it's looking nicer and nicer and nicer, which means I think there are more and more people probably in need as well because of how things are getting nicer. Yeah, anybody else? One more. Anybody else? How, how else might Dallas be different? Anybody else? Well, I want you to think about this question uh, here this morning because, like I said earlier, I believe one of the roles that the FMOS network has to play for all our different churches around the world is that we are in relationship to help us see more of God's transformation in our cities, in the cities we love, the cities we have invested in, the cities we've moved to, the cities our kids are growing up in, we desire, and I know you desire this here at Loft, you desire that Dallas be the best city it could be in the name of Jesus. And so how might that happen? How might we continue to move forward and see this place transformed and see Loft be a part of that amazing transformation? You know, as I look at the teachings of Jesus and the life of Jesus, it strikes me time and time again that Jesus, when he was here on this earth, he actually had a lot to say about this. I know sometimes it, we find that maybe a little strange because we think Jesus talked a lot about, well, perhaps personal sin, personal transformation, personal hope. But as we take a look at what Jesus did when he was here and as he walked around the different towns and villages Jesus actually gave us a picture as well of how we can join, not just in our personal transformation, but the transformation of our cities, the transformations of our neighborhoods, the transformations of the towns we live in. I'm going to be sharing uh, this morning from a story that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's a story from John chapter 4. John, one, of course, one of the four biographies of Jesus, the fourth chapter, where Jesus talks with what we now know as the, quote, Samaritan woman. Uh, Loft, you all talked about this. Pastor Sam gave three messages on John chapter 4. Actually, four, if you count the passage after uh, this, uh, the last part of uh, chapter 4. Um, and so there's a lot of good stuff already on this, on your, on your, in your archives. I definitely want to encourage you to take a look. But the thing with John chapter 4, it's really interesting. If you're familiar with the story, and we'll read through it in a brief moment here, Oftentimes, we read this story and think about, oh, this is a great story about a number of things. Things like, what is true worship? Because there's a whole talk on what true worship is. What, what are our deepest desires and cries uh, as human beings? There's a talk about living water here. This is often used as a, a passage, too, on personal evangelism. There's a great discussion Jesus has with someone who doesn't know Jesus, who isn't interested in Jesus, but Jesus brings her to Jesus. But... I want to propose to you that this passage is also about how cities and towns get transformed. And the reason I want to bring this up is because if you read the text closely, you will know that Jesus starts the story, so to speak, in this passage with a desire to teach his disciples about something. And then definitely at the end of the story, he ends the story not talking about worship, not talking about personal evangelism, but he ends the story giving a lesson on the mission of God in transforming the world. Take a look, just real quick, the, the last excerpt. If you have a Bible, we'll put it up here on the screen. The last paragraph, um, can we get the last paragraph? Yes, okay, so starting in verse uh, 34, this is the final section of this story. Jesus says this, right? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Then what, did, then, then what happens? He goes on and says this. Jesus told them, don't you know, don't you say, there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. 
For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored and you have benefited from their labor. Now, many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified, he told me everything I ever did. What's going on in this story? Why is Jesus ending with a teaching on the harvest? Why is the narrator ending with a description of the town coming to Jesus? I want to propose to you that this chapter, this story in John's gospel is trying to get us to think about how our cities get transformed. Let's take a look at the beginning of the story. You know it well. Let's just read through it and see how Jesus gets us there. John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. Now, he had to travel through Samaria, and so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, the woman said, you don't even have a bucket, and the well is deep, so where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said. For you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who's called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Just then his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left the water jar, went into town, and told the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, Jesus told them. Don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. 
The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored and you have benefited from their labor. Now many, Samar now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he said. Now again, this is a fascinating story on many fronts. But my proposal again this morning is that this is a story that is trying to show us this is how towns and villages, how cities, how places get transformed in the name of Jesus. And again, as we look at the story, as Jesus builds to the end, he tells us the main teaching he's wanting his disciples to walk away with. And this is how Jesus does a lot of things, right? Jesus oftentimes, he's trying to do two things Oftentimes, when we read stories about him, he's trying to work with some people who don't know him yet, who, some people who need healing, some people who need help. But at the same time, he's trying to teach the 12 around him something about that moment. And so there's oftentimes two sort of parallel stories we should be catching. And you see it clearly here in John 4, right? There's a woman, the Samaritan woman, but then there's this teaching he's trying to give his disciples. What is he trying to tell his disciples? Four things I want to focus in on. Four things I want to just reflect on here together as we think about how we might also join Jesus in transforming this beloved city that we call home. The first, and this comes at the end here, you'll notice, in this final teaching. The first is that, is that there is a harvest that is right in front of you. There's a, there's a harvest right in front of you and I that oftentimes we can totally look past. Right? You see this clearly in this last paragraph in verse 35. Don't you say there are still four months and then comes a the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ready for harvest. Now, there are a lot of reasons why we miss out on the harvest why we don't see it in front of us. The harvest, of, like, of course, is a metaphor for the work God has for us, this work of pointing people to his amazing love and life and goodness. There are a lot of reasons, and we'll get into a little bit later, why we miss it. But notice Jesus is just saying, hey, look, it's right here, right in front of you. And number two, notice what he's saying. It's not just right in front of you, it's also right now in front of you. Don't say three, four months from now. No, it's right here, right now. You know, sometimes I, I think about how we get eager as Jesus followers, wanting to see God work in our lives, through our lives, touching our people, the people around us, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, and all these sorts of things. And it's really good, but do you ever find yourself just thinking, oh, yeah, well, that's good for just a little bit later? I, I kind of need to do this thing first before God can really do that through me. You know, I kind of got to get my career figured out first before God can use me. I kind of need to get my house settled down so God can then use me. I got to finish my degree, and then God can use me. It, you ever just kind of naturally default that way? I know, I know it's very common. Could it be? That Dallas's best moments are not necessarily three, four months from now or three, four years from now when life gets, quote, unquote, bigger or better. Could it be that the greatest moments in life's history are literally right now, right in front of you, right now? You know, as I have driven around Dallas, I, know, I kind of shared earlier, I, I've noticed your city is growing like no other. Everyone's moving here from California, from the Northeast. 
Kudos, Texas. Way to get everyone here. Good job. Right now is the time. Right now in Richardson, right now in Allen, right now in downtown Dallas, right now is the time. And it's not just about trying to go find pockets of people. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, actually. Jesus does do something really interesting here that we need to talk about. But I, I want to propose to you that one of the greatest things with urbanization, rapid urbanization, and I actually got a doctorate degree on this. Um, this is one of the reasons why God called me to lead a network. I, I, God called me to go into studying how cities, urbanization, globalization, and Christianity come crashing together and what we should do as people following Jesus when those three things come together. And uh, so I've gone all over the world to study how this happens. And one of the fascinating things I've noticed is that when this is happening in an urban area just like Dallas, some of the number one needs that arise in these rapidly urbanizing places is a need for community. It's a need for friendship. It's a need for exactly what you have already identified as something God is wanting from you, which is awesome, you guys. You're on the track of God's transforming work here. And what, but what happens is People get thrown into these new developments together. This isn't just unique to Dallas. It's happening all over the world. And they come from different places, typically in other global cities. It's from rural areas into urban areas. And what happens is you get hundreds of different types of people, economically, culturally, ethnically, socially, living next to each other all of a sudden, and they have no idea how to interact with each other. No clue. They're used to coming from, especially in other global cities, from a village or a tribe where they all were homogenous. They get thrown into these diverse, crazy urban areas, and they're like, we well, can't even speak the same language anymore with our neighbors. And so what happens in urban places is very quickly, urban places become deserts as it relates to relationships and community, as it relates to having dinner together. And you all, you all in Dallas feel this already. I know you feel this. I've heard it even now. Could it be that right now, right now, the harvest is right in front of you, and the way you reach your harvest is simply do what you've already felt in your heart God calling you to do. Knock on a door. Get someone into your dining room for some dinner and watch the kingdom of God expand like you can't even imagine. And so we see here that Jesus is trying to tell us that the harvest is right in front of us. He's trying to tell us the timing is right now. Not three months from now, not three years from now, it's right now. But as I reflect on this story, I, I'm also reminded of, of what, what Jesus is doing developing up to this story. And there are two more ideas I want to just present to you here with John chapter 4. I think Jesus is also telling us that, you know what, my work in a village, in a town, in a city, is also going to happen, number one through unlikely heroes, and number two, unlikely displacements. Unlikely heroes and unlikely displacements. And we've kind of already talked about this, but let's, let's think about this together. First of all, this unlikely displacement. If you uh, go back to your archives in the Loft City messages, uh, Pastor Sam actually emphasizes this quite a bit. If you look at John chapter 4, you will note that John is telling us that Jesus specifically went out of his way to come to this little town named Sychar. Many of you know the background, right? That uh, Jewish people and Samaritan people did not get along. 
the animosity was more than just ethnic or geographical. It was religious. It was political. I think the best analogy we can think of today is Trump supporters and non-Trump supporters. Honestly. You just have to turn on your TV set, and you know there are clear lines in the sand, in the concrete, not just sand. There are Trump supporters, non-Trump supporters. It's ethnically based sometimes, racially based. It's religiously based. It's all these things. And never the two shall meet, right? Honestly, let's just be honest. That's how bad it was. And so Jesus is like, you know what? I need to teach my disciples about the kingdom of God, about how God wants all this animosity, all this junk to just be torn down. He wants everyone to know me. And Jesus is like, well, Jews, I know we usually go around, don't go through Samaria, but I'm going to just take us right through. Disciples, I'm going to take us right through. And he intentionally displaces himself, right? We all know that this is part of how God, needs, God will work. And we have to intentionally displace ourselves. But catch this. It's not just a temporary displacement. I mean, that's already big enough, right? That Jesus would take his non-Trump supporters or Trump-supporting disciples, pick, pick side, and go through Trump country or non-Trump country, right? That's, that's already a big deal, Right? But did you catch what happens in the text? You know, Jews and Samaritans would never do this in the first place. But did you catch what happens in the text? In verse 39. What happens is Jesus makes such an impact. They have such a good time that in verse 42, actually, or verse 40, they say, Jesus, come stay with us for two days. Come immerse yourself with us. And, and so just picture, picture the disciples, right? I mean, they won't even typically walk through this town. And so like, okay, Jesus, fine, teach us what you got to teach us, but let's get out of here, please. We got, I got you food. You don't need to eat. You talk to this woman. Let's jet. Let's go. Jesus is like, no, 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 let's linger. Why don't we sleep over for two days? It's going to be a good time. I wonder how Jesus might be inviting you and I to linger a little longer into some of the communities, some of the relationships, some of the people around you as he's wanting to use you to bring a message of hope and transformation to. How do you need to linger? Who do you need to have over a little longer than you want to? Where do you need to go yourself? So there's this unlikely displacement that happens too as, as God uses us to transform towns and villages. And then last but not least, of course, there are unlikely heroes that God loves to use. Again, Pastor Sam's given a number of messages about this in this chapter. We all know this, this Samaritan woman, for a lot of different reasons, um, was the wrong sort of person, you could say. We've seen it right here just reading through the text. But here's the deal. Jesus is always, 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 always about using the wrong sort of people to transform the world. And what I find really interesting about how Jesus does it that Jesus loves to cut through all the kind of social boundaries and barriers and help people ultimately encounter him and through encountering him, then change the world, right? That's just his formula for success. Take the unlikely people, people that most religious people say they don't have anything to do with God or they shouldn't be the ones God uses, but I'll transform them, I'll get them to me, and I'll use them. I'll do my thing, right? I mean, just think about how this story works out, right? Like, Think about the kind of people in your life right now that you would easily write off for, for religious reasons, right? This was the Samaritan woman, like, hands down. Not only was she ethnically, culturally the wrong person, right? So let's go back to the Trump supporter, non-Trump supporter, right? But also, morally, she was totally the wrong candidate as well. And yet God is saying, no, I'm going to allow her to encounter me, 
I'm going to use her. You know, what, what fascinates me about every urban space that our network is in, that you are in right now, in this beautiful city of Dallas, there are pockets of people here that I know right now you feel like, I have no idea how God is going to reach that pocket. They are so different from us. They're so different from me, not just culturally, ethnically, religiously, but morally. I think of one of the communities that I think a lot of Jesus following people have no clue what's going to happen to, the LGBTQ community. And sometimes we're just like wondering, like, God, what? I don't even know what to think. I don't know how to, like, in, like, I just don't even have a clue what to do. I feel like that's what the Samaritan woman is going through. Could it be? Could it be that God is already there working? Could it be that loft is going to be that place where those pockets of Dallas see the transformation of Jesus and those whole pockets start flocking to Jesus because they've found the true source of living water. You know, um, one of the really cool things about the network as we have um, continued to plant churches, and again, thank you, Loft, for having your skin in the game. I don't know if you all know this, but you all give uh, to one of the churches in uh, one of the church plants in South Africa right now, the one in Bromfontein, Johannesburg. Um, you guys have helped a number of the other church plants going on. It's really exciting. Uh, one of the newer church plants coming online right now is San Diego. We have like multiple planters planting in the re different regions of San Diego. And uh, one of them is being uh, co-led by a person named Ch um, Carlos Martinez. Um, Carlos has a crazy testimony because Carlos was one of those guys that when he first came to Athos with his family, uh, San Diego was far from God, didn't want anything to Jesus. He was making about uh, prior to, few, uh, maybe a few years prior to coming into Athos, he was making over $10,000 a month selling drugs, right? So not your like typical church planting candidate like person. You just don't think, oh, yeah, drug dealer, $10,000, plant churches. Okay, that's great. No. He comes. He encounters Jesus. It's a long discipleship process for sure. But he is now slated to be one of the newest church planters in the network. And I love thinking about his story. and just, just, It excites me that that's the kind of Jesus we follow. And it excites me that Loft, as you run after Jesus, and as you look to see Dallas transformed, that you will have, you already have, and you will continue to have, but you will have even more stories of people like Carlos who will transform this city. Can I invite you to stand? And I'd like to just lead. You all know a word of prayer. As you stand, can I just invite you, if you feel comfortable, to put your hands out, uh, palms up as an act of receiving and also giving to God. And as you do that, I just want to ask you a few questions this morning encourage you to have this exchange with, with Jesus. Now, first of all, has Jesus been speaking to you about the transformation of Dallas and his desire to use you? If so, can I just invite you to give what you got to give to Jesus to make it happen? Receive what you need to receive from Jesus to make it happen? Take a moment to do that right now. Now, of course, some of you here are new to Jesus, new to God, and today's conversation is like, whoa, this is 
sort of beyond me, and I'm not sure how to process all this. Let me just say your, your first step definitely is to come to Jesus like the Samaritan woman came to Jesus and acknowledge that you're looking for something, something deep right now. Jesus is telling you that I am that deeper water that you're actually thirsty for. You just don't know it quite yet. But I want to give you myself. And so if you find yourself in that place, can I just invite you to give, have this exchange with Jesus too? And just say, Jesus, I, I want you as this deeper living water that I need. Yes, I give you myself to make this happen. God, I am just thankful for this amazing family called Loft. You, before we could even imagine, you knew about Loft. You had desires and plans and dreams for Loft. And some years ago, you decided to use your humble servant Sam and some others to say, you know what? What if God is calling us to be a new community here in Dallas? They obeyed you. They took these steps. And now look at, look at them. Look at Loft. It's a beautiful place. And yet, Jesus, as we look beyond ourselves into the city, we realize there are bigger things happening here that, we, that are overwhelming, that we don't know how to process, that we don't know what to do. And yet, we feel your urge, your invitation Be a part of this harvest that you are trying to gather in. Oh God, use us. Take our meager little selves. Use us in ways we can't imagine. So that whole swaths of Dallas running to you. Messiah, the one who told us everything we ever did and still loved us fully and completely. In Jesus' name.